You mentioned that you plan to write a book about the martyrs who were martyred under President Calles of Mexico. Yeah, it's a long time ago. Pre is an old party. Yes. It's kind of yesterday's news as it is, never mind the guy who kind of started yes. it. Yes. Why at this date do you think it's important? For two reasons. Number one, Hispanics don't know their own history. And number two, Catholics in general don't know their own history. It is very surprising to the average Catholic on the street to tell him that just 70 or 80 years ago, the church in Mexico was under very severe persecution conditions and priests were being run down and shot by the federal government. Just to have that happen so close to our border so recently is a surprise. So people have short memories. It's so even um, more recent than that in Central America. In Central America, right. And I've done some In writing. Nicaragua and El Salvador. I've done some writing on that. Um, and I just think that in this day and age, with all the problems we've had in the priesthood, we've had our difficult problems over the past 10 years, we need heroes. And many of these people were heroes. And what language do you plan to write that book in English oh God, or Spanish? In English, in English please. <laughs> it would be published in Spanish by the, by the publishers. They might they'd oh, they'd hire they'd someone to translate it. They will, yeah. Do you speak Gaelic? I used to. I used to speak Gaelic fluently uh, because we learned Gaelic all through grade school and high school. I actually learned English through Gaelic. In grade school, Gaelic was the language that was spoken. However, by now, it's just dormant. When I try to speak Gaelic, you know what comes out? Spanish words. I presume that if I was immersed for a month or two, it would come back. I presume it would, but right now I can't speak. Is there anyone who actively speaks Gaelic in the world right now in their daily life? Oh, yes. There are pockets, small pockets in Ireland where it's spoken. I believe Ackle Island, which is off the coast, off the west coast, they would still speak in very small, however, smaller and smaller communities. But not in Belfast or Dublin or no. any place like now, that? No. Now, there are one or two priests here who have kept it up. Some of the Irish guys here who grew up in Ireland have kept it up and actually say Mass in, Spanish, in Gaelic. In what other ways are you of service to the community that bear mentioning? Well, I mean, my present job is an institutional job. It's in, here in the, in the bureaucracy, um, trying to guide us through difficult so times. So what do you do? Um, What's your main, two or three main responsibilities? Personnel issues, uh, you know, if there's a problem in a parish. When you have 103 parishes with schools and staff and secretaries and all, everything that involves a parish, there's always some place where there's a personnel issue, some dispute, some fight, some... Uh, parishioner who's upset at something. So a lot of our work is, has to do with personnel. Then we have the sexual abuse issues. Um, you know, we have to deal with them. How much of your time does that take up? It seems like it should be more or less settled at this point. You would think, but there's just um, new, new, new ones keep coming in. We do have a protocol right now that's much more specific. It kicks in right away. But we do have to spend time on that. But then on weekends, I celebrate Mass in the parish I live in. I just moved. I was in the cathedral. Um, you celebrate mass as though you were the parish, as though you were the pastor of the parish. Well, let's see. The man helped me, the pastor. Okay. Yeah, I was the rector of the cathedral for six or eight years. Then I stayed on as a man in residence when the new rector took over. So I helped out there for two or th two or three. <coughs> I'm now in another parish, helping out. The parish I'm in is eighty percent Mexican. Where is and, it? And it's a matter of conception on Broadway, just up the street here on Broadway. It's close to work, which is why I moved there. The pastor is Colombian, and he's got poor English, and I've got poor Spanish. So I take the English masses there. He takes the Spanish. So it's a nice little niche I can help him with. And it's close to work. What was the first service project in your life that you can remember being, being part of? Well, yeah, as a seminarian... Um, uh, we, we were sent out over the summer to visit to other, to other countries where I was sent to Scotland and we just visited the people. That was just visiting the people and inviting them back to church. Um, in Sacramento at the cathedral, I, you know, I became exposed for the first time to poverty and to helping poor people. We would help people at the door. They would come to the door. We would give them food and uh, any food vouchers, sometimes clothing anything we could do in that regard. It was limited because our money was limited. Then when I came back there in the year 2000, we um, had, um, that became a big, very big issue, the question of homeless. When I arrived at the cathedral in, two, in the year 2000, 
there were like 30 to 40 people every night sleeping on the steps of the cathedral. These were homeless people who didn't have a place to stay. They would, they would sleep on the steps of the cathedral. And the businesses on, on K Street objected, I think with reason, because you know the, they had their restaurants, and these people were kind of harassing the people going in to get... They were panhandling. Panhandling. And they pressured us to do something about it. So did the police pressure us to do something about it. And my family is involved in hotel work and restaurant ownership. So I understand that the business community needs some kind of order. However, I did feel very strongly that the church is not a business. And that to just push them off the steps of the cathedral every night without having an alternative is not the Christian thing to do. And so I basically refused to do that. and got pressure from the city, from the police, and from the business owners. So eventually the city volunteered to mediate the situation. And so they paid for a mediator who met with us for um, over a period of like five or six months. Once a month we would meet the business people and uh, those of us in the parish to try to mediate a solution. What we came up with in the end was the businesses of uh, the square, of the Cathedral Square, uh, they uh, agreed to pay so much each month towards a program that would help these people to get housing. And so we were housing five or six people a month in a housing project and getting them work. It was a, we felt it was a victory and the, the, you know, the businesses I think became very into it and very open to helping the poor as a result of the project. How can we end homelessness? This is where I'm going to bring in Dorothy Day. Please. Who is Dorothy Day? Dorothy Day is the founder of the Catholic Worker Movement of which Loaves and Fishes is a part. She is one of the heroes of my life, has had enormous influence in my life. I met her, um, in fact, and my first meeting with her was back in about 69. She gave a talk at the Newman Center in Sacramento. And in that talk, she gave her usual stock talk. She described how she began as a communist. She was attracted to the world community, social justice, equality ideal of the, communi of the communists realized that it's not real. It, in practice, the communists are no better than we are. Became attracted to the Catholic Church and she became a Catholic. And during the question period, a student, an MSW student from Sac State asked a question. He said, you know, I understand you founded the Catholic Worker Movement, these soup kitchens to help the poor after you became Catholic, but what are you doing to reach the, the roots of poverty, to get into the roots of poverty? And she said, nothing. Well, he said, but what's, what's the point of that then? And she said, it's the folly of the cross. And what she meant by that is, I'm sure the student didn't get it, what she meant by that is that we Christians worked for a better world. We worked to help uh, bring forward social justice, help the poor. But it's with the realization that the poor will always be with us. We do not have here, we do not have here a lasting city. We will always have sin, selfishness, injustice. And we belong to another world, but we do all we can to improve this world while we're here. You're saying that you think that it's not possible to end homelessness. It's not possible to end injustice. A specific area of homelessness in a city, I would hope is possible. But let me tell you, we've been talking about homeless in Sacramento for 40 years. It's still around. I don't see any solutions. I do feel this. I think that sometimes we Christians are accused of ignoring this world and concentrating on the next world. I think you do both. Uh, we have to do all we can in this world to relieve poverty. And that famous mess in Matthew, final judgment scene, where the, the people, the sheep and the goats, are judged by how they visit the prisoner, help the poor, is very crucial. How can we generate a change of heart such as that? I think that uh, the only person you can change is yourself. You can't change the world. Everybody has got to make the decision within himself for that change of heart. I think it takes a lifetime for all of us. We begin much more selfish than we are later, hopefully. I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's a lifelong struggle to overcome our own selfishness, our own egos, our own, insensi our own insensitivity. But you're right, we have to work towards a change of heart. But there, there will always be a struggle and people who have not done it yet. 
Was there a moment at which you knew that service, whether it be through the church or in general, was going to be a major aspect of your life? Did you have an epiphany like Paul on the road to Damascus? Or describe that process for us. Absolutely. I mean, my, my decision to, to apply for the priesthood was a decision to help others, to help other people. During a retreat uh, at the end of high school, and they provided these retreat opportunities for us to make our minds up about our, our future careers. During that retreat, I thought this thing through and, and thought, well, it's either I enter the priesthood and try it out, try it out, or enter law, and I'll go as a lawyer. And I did go to seminary, and I, for the first couple of years, I was literally trying it out and thinking, well, I, I would have a degree, college degree to fall back on if I do leave, but eventually it became clear this is what I feel called to. Do you have a particular private spiritual practice other than the Eucharist or the Mass? Well, I mentioned this before we started. Um, my daily prayer is very much centered on the Psalms. Uh, the Psalms to me are just tremendous uh, spiritual nourishment. Uh, and it's something they told us in seminary, I found to be true, is that the Psalms wear well. They, they, they don't get, they never get old or boring. And all the time you're seeing new nuances or new phrases you didn't notice before. So I literally, several times a day, because our Liturgy of the Hours is based on the Psalms, I use the Psalms and find them very spiritual. At the beginning of this conversation, you spoke about how you thought a life lived solely for oneself was an empty and hollow life. And that resonated with one of my viewers but they're timid, they've never served anyone or anything outside themselves. What would be a good beginner's service project that they could partake in in order to test your theory? Well, uh, you know, a soup kitchen like loaves and fishes. Every time I go there, I feel good, even though I have to drag myself over to go there, and sometimes I'm tired. I feel good just seeing these people. You've got to do it. See people who have less than you have and realize that when you help others like that, you get more of it than they do. What might they expect to get out of it? You just feel privileged being able to help a human being who's in need and you could be that human being yourself. Um, when I was a seminarian, I remember as a seminarian, they used to have us go out to the poor parishes of Dublin and um, visit the poor with an organization called the Vincent de Paul Society. And I was assigned to this man who owned uh, a shoe factory in a nearby town of Drada. He drove a Mercedes Benz, he was a wealthy man. And that first night we went to this tenement uh, building and visited this poor family on the second floor, a lady with four kids and no husband. And he gave every kid in that house a new pair of shoes. And driving home, I asked him about it, and he said, you know, he said, I get more pleasure out of that than I do out of sitting in my office and driving, running the factory. The direct face-to-face -face, um, helping of people who need that kind of help is enormously fulfilling. I never forgot that example. That, that to me was real spirituality. Who are your heroes? Dorothy Day is one of them. Why? Um, well, her story of her journey, uh, of, of uh, you know being attracted to the communist ideal of a universal brotherhood, and realizing that that doesn't do it because they're not any more universal brother than we are, the communists, and then being attracted to the Catholic Church, and what attracted her was she saw these these simple poor people going into church and lighting a candle, and then praying, and she was fascinated by the way that the Catholic culture touched people like that. And um, then her story of conversion, which I can tell if you want, her whole story of conversion uh, and discovering Catholicism. We can look it up ourselves. Yeah, but um, it was her interpretation of the faith, uh, the emphasis.